Hi, but I just thought I'd take a few minutes and greet all of you, welcome you, and I'll do this again at 6.30. But uh, just to say it's lovely, I'm delighted that all of you are here physically. After two years of uh, masks and all the protocols, it's nice to be able to actually see people, shake hands and so on and so forth. So I'll say this again, but can I request all of you to put your phones on silent? You know, with new phones and advancing age, if you don't know how to put your phone on silent, look right, look left. Somebody might help you. And the last time around, which is pre-COVID, we had to remind people that you also have to switch your alarms off. That even if a phone is in silent mode, the alarms can go off. So in case you have an alarm, please, I should do that myself. So. This place here, please come right up. Please come. We'll start at 6.30 sharp, and we plan to finish by 20.00, that's 8 p.m. sharp again. So if anybody has to leave earlier, and I understand the pressures of Delhi and traffic and other commitments, my only request is do the shuffle now. Sit on the extreme ends of your row so that you can exit unobtrusively. I hope you don't think I'm being rude. We'd request and urge all of you to be here till 8 p.m. But in the event, I understand, uh, please make your exit very unobtrusive or quietly. I mean, there's place in front. Why don't you come up? Please come. Here, there's place here, there's place there. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is 18.30, half past six, so we'll cast off. And again, let me welcome all of you on behalf of the India Habitat Center and the Society for Policy Studies. This is a lecture series that we had begun almost six years ago, and we were able to maintain a certain tempo pre-COVID. So I think it's a bit like saying that our life now can be reviewed as pre-COVID and I hope we can use the term post-COVID. I'm not quite sure if it's premature, but this is the first lecture that we have been able to convene after the experience that we've all gone through individually and collectively as far as the COVID pandemic is concerned. So it's been, as I said, very gratifying for both the Habitat and the SPS that we have got this kind of a response. There are many reasons for that, not least the profile of our speaker for this evening, Professor Madhavan Palat, but I'll come to him in a moment. But I just wanted to again welcome all those who are coming here for the first time for this lecture series and those who have been with us in the past it's a case of renewing contact and saying that we are delighted that you're back. 
Today, in particular, I want to acknowledge uh, both the presence and the fact that we've had this kind of a participation. First of all, from this extended, I don't want to use the word fan club and embarrass Madhavan, but uh, well wishers and this very, I would say, large cluster of friends and students and those, I think, who hold Professor Palat in high esteem. And when we announced this lecture, the response that the Habitat got and our society got was very, very robust and Madhavan, I want to thank you and also embarrass you and say that we've never had this kind of a response for lecture series that we've had in the past. <laughs> and I'm saying this knowing fully well that we have in our midst other speakers who have been part of the series, Ravi and various other people here this evening, but more seriously, it's lovely to have this kind of an audience response. I particularly want to acknowledge the presence of our students, in this case from Delhi University. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but Kamla Nehru, right? Lovely. My affiliation is Gargi and LSR, but you know, let it not be said that I did not recognize Kamla Nehru. And you know, the reason is my wife is Gargi LSR, that's why I'm saying that. But seriously, if I missed any other colleges, universities, please let me know. But we have made this uh, conscious attempt to reach out to Gen Next wherever Gen Next is, both in Delhi and outside of Delhi. And I'm also very glad to inform all of you that this particular lecture is being streamed live. And we've had, again, a very robust response from outside of Delhi, particularly from young people who are more off with social media and who saw the announcement of this lecture on different platforms and tuned in. And I gather from our technical team that the number of people who have tuned in literally for this 6.30 lecture has been quite good. So those who are not here physically and who are here with us on cyber, greetings and thank you very much for joining us and I hope we can do this again. As far as our lecture today is concerned, you know the subject and you know the speaker, most of you. Ukraine and the war there, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I'm deliberately using that term, that phrase, though there has been some reticence and hesitation on the part of the Indian government in terms of how exactly they wanted to describe this. Moscow itself has called this a special operation. This is war. It's been tragic. It's come into our drawing rooms. It was said in 1991 Perhaps many, some of you were not born then, but in 1991, we had the first war in Iraq, the war for Kuwait. And that's almost 31 years ago. And it was said that CNN had brought that war into our drawing rooms, the Tomahawk missile and various other strands of that war. The war in Ukraine has been magnified many times over in terms of the information, the images, and every citizen, every victim now is a journalist beaming pictures. And one of the features of this war has been this information overload. And that in turn has been utilized, exploited in different ways. And we have many narratives about the Ukraine war. But I think there's one broad conclusion, it's a bit tentative, that as in the case of any war, there is a fog. And this is a fog of many layers, of many domains. I think what is reasonably clear is that this is going to be a defining moment as far as this decade is concerned, for sure. Perhaps for this half century. But this is the kind of assessment and I would say inferences that would be drawn as we go along. And there is more credible information available about how this war is unfolding. There is deep anxiety on one strand, and that is the nuclear dimension. You'll remember that fairly early on in this war, President Putin drew attention to Russia's capability as far as WMD, weapons of mass destruction, were concerned. And that, I think, is cause for concern, even though most experts ever that it would never happen. But there was a similar sentiment, if you remember, in end Jan, early Feb, that Russia would not invade, Russia would not wage war. But to the extent that the future remains opaque in terms of where and how, or what are the paths, lots of gaming has gone on among professional circles about this war. I think perhaps we can look at the past 
in a reasonably informed way to the extent that the past does influence and shape what is happening now. And again, there are many variations of the formulation. We've had Professor Mia Shaima from the United States who has given us his own assessment and they have roped in all the big names as far as American academia and the elite of America, whether it's Henry Kissinger or George Cannon and what they had said and warned at that time. And I do recall that we had received, when I say we at the Institute of Defense Studies many years ago, we received, we received Professor Primakov before he became Prime Minister Primakov. And these were issues that were discussed at that time. The Cold War had just ended. And I do recall that in that little interaction, he was here for a few days. He drew attention to Ukraine and issues of that sort at that time. But we can, I think, have a more informed understanding of the past. And that really is the aim of the exercise this evening, that we are very glad that Professor Madhavan Palat could join us, find the time at very short notice, if I may add, when we reached out to him. He's a historian of impeccable credentials. Those of you who know him, many in this audience, I think, know him very well. His scholarship in his own domain, Russian history, is, I think, right at the very top. He's internationally recognized. He taught at the Jawaharlal Nehru University for many years, three decades, if I'm not mistaken, from 1974 to 2004, Madhavan. And subsequently, of course, he was at better known amongst other hats that he wore for being the editor of the works of Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru when he was at the Nehru Memorial. I had occasion to hear Professor Palat over the last few years, pre-COVID, I would say, he spoke to us at the Nehru Memorial and in other places and at JNU. All I can say is that he's a riveting speaker. And if you look at him, you'll see what I would call as the image of a man who knows too much. And Russian history is more than a thousand years old, if not older in terms of genealogy. And he's taken on this task saying that he'll say his piece in 40 minutes. So there you are. I shall not delay the proceedings. I want to thank all of you once again who have come and those of you who have just joined Please put your phones on silent if you haven't already done so. I think courtesy demands that a speaker of the gravitas and eminence that Professor Madhavan Palat brings to this forum should not be disturbed by cell phones. On that note, sir, may I invite you? Thank you very much Uday, for inviting me and in fact giving me such a handsome recommendation that I'd be hard put to live up to it. But anyway, I'll do my best. Uh, but it's great to be able to meet uh, physically once again after all these years of being in ether, as it were, uh, and now to see face to face. And I'm glad the Stampede is not what Habitat Center claimed it was, and that there are some empty seats available after all. Huh? <laughs> uh, now, uh, it is Uday who told me to uh, finish it in uh, 40 minutes, all 1,000 years of Ukraine in history. Uh, so it'll be a bit of a <coughs> run for that reason. But first of all, may I uh, request you to just get used to the divisions of, the U of Ukraine which I think by now, because the newspapers have been talking about it so much, you must be very well aware of. But nonetheless, let me just point it out very briefly, because this is something we'll be <coughs> referring to periodically. Uh, yeah. Do you see up there where Poland is? And just east of where Poland is written, uh, that whole section. It's, it, doesn't seem to be working. It is actually working, yeah. Uh, roughly from here to here is what you'd call the West, consisting of two ancient historical provinces called Gerisia and Volinia. Uh, 
the uh, and nowadays they write in Ukrainian or Polish is called Volin. In uh, Russian it's Volinia. And in English I think it comes in both forms, depending which book you read, which published when. So it's up there. This is the important. And that town of Lvov or Lviv is the capital of Galicia. It is the uh, most important center of Western Ukraine, the center of Ukrainian nationalism in all respects and further up Lutsk and up that way and by the way that western Ukrainian stretch goes into Poland further to Helmno, it's not there, all right uh, Poland has grabbed a part of, part of old Ukraine that way and the east is of course, that's much more familiar I think uh, it's Luhansk and Donetsk but it's more than that uh, it's a larger section which is called the Donbass, of which these two portions are now declared to be independent. So that west and east, and uh, between them runs the river, the great Dnieper. Uh, Kiev is up there, and it's the capital, for, I mean, it's, it's the home of all Russians, Ukrainians, and Vera uh, Russians. Uh, the origin of everything and south here is the Cossack steppe see Zaporizhia the Zaporozhian Sech is here and after that comes new Russia and Ukraine and uh, Crimea the big division is between this and this and in between they have to they're not so decided now the problem with Ukraine is <coughs> it's a heavily divided society. Uh, it is so divided that it turns out to be the battlefield between the two big powers. So actually what we are witnessing, uh, which you call the Ukrainian war, is a war between America and Russia, essentially. Fought in different ways, America through financial instruments and uh, sanctions and all the rest, and Russia by direct invasion to prevent the advance of uh, NATO. Ukraine does not, unfortunately, have an independent role. It is the battlefield. Uh, and it doesn't have an independent role because it is so divided. Each side, wha each part of it is orienting itself to another, either to, the, to America or to Russia. I mean, America means here America, European Union, or to Russia. And they're not able to come together to decide on what is Ukrainian or what, how to be independent. Uh, and this is particularly interesting for us to know because th these are choices we made back in the 1950s itself with non-alignment. Exactly the problem that is faced. Do you have to go to the West or to the, to, uh, to the East and the Soviet Union? Said no, it has to be non-alignment. We were able to carry it off. But very few countries are able to carry it off. Only India and China actually did. All the others have fallen victim. And we see when Ukraine became independent, it has fallen victim. It hasn't been able to make the choice. So it has become the battlefield between the two and it reminds me very strongly of uh, Afghanistan for 200 years it has been the battlefield of the great empires the British and Russian empires fighting it out over where exactly the boundary should be drawn and Afghanistan was laid waste periodically and otherwise not allowed to develop into an independent uh, into a modern state always because the uh, regimes were being uh, changed by the British uh, for a long time and then after the second world war America took the lead and you know the story of Afghanistan now it has never been able to set up as an independent state and interestingly this, just as Afghans are always glorified as heroic indomitable uh, never submitting to a foreigner and so on although the foreigners are crisscrossing the country and laying it waste all the time it is now the same story with Ukraine and um, Zelensky in some senses represents that so heroically defending Ukraine standing up to the a Russian bully, but in some sense completely helpless. He's uh, the victim of both sides. And the arguments on both sides are both strategic and cultural. And they're both are immensely powerful. The cultural has a strategic significance of its own. And that is what I'd like to take you to, through. And my point is that is to demonstrate how, how little uh, initiative Ukraine actually has and how much it is a victim of its own internal divisions and why it is so porous and open to the great powers on either side to interfere and decide for Ukraine which way it should go. Uh, Ukrainians are very passionate about all these matters. They do take a, uh, obviously play a role. But 
they're not the decisive factor in each case. So uh, they are pulled in both directions. Uh, the uh, divisions began as long ago as the 13th century, when uh, the division between Europe, uh, uh, between uh, Latin Christendom and Orthodox Christianity. That is the line of division. And surprisingly, that division continues down to this day. And I, I hope I'll be able to point out the various ways in that division reappears again and again down into the 21st century. It is not exactly the same as it was then, but the geography is the same. And we see it again and again. That is why I pointed out the western portion, which is oriented westward to Catholic Europe and subsequently to the kingdoms of Poland and Hungary and the Habsburg Empire. And in the uh, 20th century, again Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia and so on, and in the east to Russia. And what happens in between <coughs> is the interesting part. Who, who manages to create a state? Now, what are Putin's justifications for uh, invading? I have no hesitation to say it is an invasion. Uh, invading uh, Ukraine. Uh, they are familiar to you, all the arguments, but let me run through them quickly. First of all, it is a creeping advance of NATO, uh, which he presents as an exist existential threat to Russia. If NATO is on the borders, then Russia cannot continue to be independent or secure the way it is expected to be. It ex he is responsible for. So NATO is a such a th threat, and it is now reaching the borders of Russia. Uh, if Ukraine also goes in, and as NATO threatened, Georgia also uh, in 2008. And you know what happened then. And then Putin has gone on to set it in the context of the 20th century. The German invasion during the First World War between 1914 and 18, when large parts of uh, the Russian Empire were incorporated into Germany or under German occupation, Ukraine, the Baltic and so on, the same Ukraine. Uh, then in during the Civil War of 1918 to 21, when again Ukraine uh, changed hands, all, all parts of Ukraine changed hands, I think uh, uh, Kiev changed hands 11 times or so. During those uh, during the civil war years, and you had Germans, um, Poles, uh, Russians, Bolsheviks, and White Russians. The, that is the ones who had been overthrown by the Bolsheviks, all fighting there, along with mass insurrections by Ukrainian peasants, anarchists, and God knows who else, and then interventions by uh, the Western Allies during the civil war. So Ukraine was a full-scale battlefield in a way that no, no other part of the Russian Empire was. But uh, uh, Putin has gone on beyond that into um, pointing out all the Cold War hostility from the West, followed by the betrayal of 1990 when uh, it was promised that uh, Ukraine, uh, that NATO shall not expand, and they did expand when the Warsaw Pact was dissolved. It just goes on. So the NATO has now expanded into the whole of the Baltic, into uh, Poland, Romania, and Hungary, and now it is threatening to reach into the ex-Soviet uh, republics. It has already gone into the Baltic republics, but it is threatening to come right up against Russia itself. That was accompanied by the color revolutions. You know, the attempted uh, cha uh, regime changes in Ukraine, Georgia, and Kyrgyzstan. These are called the color revolutions, inspired by America. Uh, whether it was I mean, there's a powerful role that uh, America has played there. Uh, whether it is as strong a role as Putin uh, says it is, is another matter. But Putin has made it into a case. And generally, the Russian establishment makes it a case of CIA intervention in Russian uh, politics. And, of course, the Chechnya uh, insurgency, which, was, which he says was powerfully supported by the West. And he says, I know because I was in charge of intelligence. So I received all the intelligence and I know what happened. So all these charges he has brought against them. <coughs> but he doesn't stop there. He brought, brought the important charge of, de of uh, the Nazi revival in Ukraine. This has been immediately dismissed in the Western media and uh, Western governments as a bit of uh, Putinesque paranoia and complete fiction. He's inventing it out of his uh, top of his head. Well, the basis on which Putin has made this charge and is demanding the denazification of Ukraine is that there is there are bodies inside Ukraine which are uh, xenophobically nationalist, racist, anti-Semitic, uh, terrorist, uh, who are the heirs of the collaborators of the Nazis, 
with the Nazis and are uh, virulently anti-Russian. There are such groups there. One such group is what is known as the Azov Brigade, which you might have read off in the press recently. It was set up immediately after the Crimean annexation, and its job was to hunt down traitors, and traitors means anybody who is anyway oriented towards Russia, and their techniques are very violent, indeed. They are more like uh, fascist stormtroopers, indeed. That is why he calls it denazification. And they are racist in the conventional sense of uh, uh, early 20th century Europe. But, but it is interesting that they are racist and ironic that they are racist, although the ra uh, European racism, uh, or Nazi racism, was directed against the Slavs. And Hitler had uh, earmarked 32 million Slavs for genocide. Uh, but contradictions don't matter. They always uh, occur. And these people look upon the uh, uh, Russians as a danger who have to be exterminated. Oh, well, not exterminated, I'm sorry. Uh, not now, at any rate. But the attitude is of that kind, and certainly anti-Semitic. Now, th these are the uh, people that Putin is referring to. In addition, he's referring to the remnants of the uh, uh, Nazi collaboration of the Second World War. Now, this is a dark history, which we hear of rather less because it is overtaken by the more hideous history of the anti-Semitism and the slaughter of the Jews. But in Galicia, uh, Volhynia, those are the same two Western provinces that I've been talking about, uh, which is uh, so, so uh, nationalistic, so extremely nationalistic, they managed to slaughter as many as about 100,000 Poles. We do not know the exact figures. You know, when these mass slaughters occur and are conducted by these uh, informal groups going around, we do not know exact figures. But estimates are around that much. It was done during, in 1943 in the middle of the war in the hope of having a territory which is completely free of Poles, so that will be only Ukrainian after the war. And the reason they had to, wanted to do so is that that was a territory which was being ruled by Poland after the First World War. So this was a uh, targeted cleansing. Uh, ethnic cleansing would be the right word, although the uh, Poles have said this should be called genocide in itself. So to, uh, to Russia, this brings up a very dark memory indeed. And the man who was in charge of it, or who was a chief uh, inspirer, the leader of all these groups, was a man called Stepan Bandera. He finally fell victim to, I mean, he was put into concentration camps by the Nazis because he went too far. And finally, he was assassinated by the KGB after the Second World War. But he was a typical fascist of this kind. Nazi collaborator, did everything, uh, all, all the things that I've just described. Now, Bandera brings up the worst memories on the Russian side. Uh, we, uh, and uh, as if to prove that there is a Nazi element in uh, Ukraine. In 2010, Yushchenko, the newly elected president, the pro-Western president, awarded him the Medal of Hero of Ukraine. I mean, that is the highest award that you can possibly win. Something like a Bharat threat now. Yeah. Uh, there was such outrage the world over, including in Israel, because he's an anti-Semite also, that however anti-Russian they might be, they could not stomach this. So worldwide condemnation followed, and finally, the award was withdrawn. But the fact that the president could think of doing such a thing, and uh, he who had come in and practically put there by the European conglomerates, I'll just come to that in a moment, uh, shows how deep is the support for it, that he thought it was worth his while to do so. He'd get support in Galicia, Volhynia by doing such things. Now, this is the uh, context of Putin's uh, charge of uh, uh, Nazi revival. To this, he's added another uh, grievance. He's saying that there's an American strategy now to destabilize Russia by creating a domestic constituency, which will be entirely in favor of uh, Western intervention of uh, Western structures of power, and will seek to overthrow Putin, uh, uh, the uh, not Putin or the current regime. Uh, as if to prove him right, Biden only the other day said there should be a regime change. Putin should be dethroned. But independent of that, uh, uh, Putin made the state, uh, demand earlier. He is going back to an earlier problem that occurred in the late Soviet Union. This is not merely a problem of the fifth column. That occurs always during war. 
uh, it is not a ma matter of people seeking out trends in the enemy territory. Uh, America consistently and successfully created a domestic constituency in the Soviet Union which is very pro-Western. This is called the dissident intelligentsia. Uh, they are uh, violently hostile to the Soviet regime, very pro-Western, and they created the right atmosphere domestically uh, because of their great intellectual and other uh, capacities. Uh, that when Gorbachev split the Communist Party, the reforming wing of the Communist Party joined hands with these people and they together brought down the Soviet Union, finally installed uh, uh, Yeltsin in place and he brought down the economy itself through liberalization and all the horrors that followed throughout the 1990s when half of Russia was sold off to the oligarchs and so on. That is a story and all of them ended up in London uh, that we read of nowadays. Now all these uh, things occurred uh, with the active uh, participation of this domestic constituency which is so western oriented who P Putin says is living psychologically in Miami or in the or on the Riviera uh, uh, being provocative there but, but that's a point. Uh, now the uh, what are Biden's justifications for this, uh, for the counterattack? And he has counterattacked. It's it's full-scale war, but war through financial instruments uh, and economic instruments. It hasn't yet come to physical war. Uh, it has been claimed by all Western sources, and of course by Biden, that this is an attack upon the West and Western values. It's an ancient claim, of course. Throughout the Cold War, this was going on, and even in the 19th century, Russia was something that is always anti-Western and violating Western values in one way or the other. Now, the, the definition of the West, as used in Europe, and the definition of Europe, sorry, as used there, always is, as I said, the territory of Latin Christendom. It is separated from Orthodox Christianity in the East and Islam in the West, and bounded by the Atlantic Ocean in the uh, um, uh, yes, Islam in the south and uh, bounded by the Atlantic Ocean in the west. That is what constitutes Europe. Of course now the west means much more where Europe has expanded into North America and South America and so on. But this Europe is what is being attacked by Putin's advance, is the claim. And uh, the uh, ir irony of it is that in the west Russia, Ukraine and Belarus are never included in Europe. Ukraine and Russia and Belarus are firmly part of the east of Russia, the barbaric east or the Huns or whatever you call them at various times. Uh, and now Ukraine has been admitted into the select club by uh, this definition. It is part of great power play of course, but the Ukraine has made made into the bearer of the west of Europe and European values, uh, rather summarily. And the values that are being violated by Russia by this kind of an invasion are, well we know them, what they always claim to be the values, their democracy, rationality, the rule of law, human rights, an egalitarian society, uh, human egalitarian society, prosperity and social welfare and similar good things of life. That is, those are, these are what's called Western values, the Western way, way of life, which Ukraine is meant to, have been, meant to have embodied. I don't know on what basis they said so. Ukraine is a cesspool of corruption uh, in every other respect. But anyway, uh, that's how they claim it to be so. This is what is uh, under threat. Now, in Russia, Russian liberals accept these classifications. The, uh, Russia is internally divided. Liberals say, see themselves as European and these are values that they espouse and this is what they see as European. The rest of Russia, which is a majority I would say, don't see quite these values. They see the other side of Europe, which would be genocide, anti-Semitism, imperialism, uh, global warfare and the rest. So there's a hideous side of Europe which is seen by a whole lot of others, which uh, in, when they talk in Europe today about European values, they completely exclude. Although it is not very long ago that these values were propagated in Europe in uh, great intensity. Uh, 
And in addition to that, of course, in Russia, the Orthodox Church detests the Roman Catholic Church. The, that is the ancient challenger. It is now more than 1,200 years old. 1,000 year, uh, years old, sorry. It goes back into the 11th century. So you have a very ancient division. And all through this millennium, the danger has been from this area. And the boundary keeps shifting here and there, according to convenience. And we've seen the most recent shift. These are the arguments used. So uh, in what way is then the, uh, how does this line of division occur? And how do they shift? And why is it so permanent is the interesting point. And why, does, why is Ukraine still divided as it was divided back in the 13th century in the same way? Uh, such that Ukraine cannot set up an independent state, effective independent state which is why it is such a victim. And I'd like to take you through that. It is a very ancient history and a very powerful history. Uh, and of course, it's interesting to know why, in spite of all that, they cannot get together. It should be possible. Divided peoples have got together and created nations. Why is that Ukraine is not able to? Now, the uh, conversion to Christianity took place in the 10th century by a heroic and legendary king of uh, Kiev called Vladimir also known as Saint Vladimir. His statue is there up on the bridge at Kiev. You might have seen it in the newspapers the other day. They've covered it up, lest it be bombed. Uh, so the great Prince Vladimir converted and told his entire population to convert simultaneously. Uh, that's the advantage of being a great prince. You can tell everybody to convert. And they all did uh, obediently. So Kiev became uh, uh, Christian at, uh, back in the 10th century. Shortly thereafter, the great schism occurred in the Christian world. Uh, orthodoxy split off from Roman Catholicism. And the Patriarch of Constantinople became the leader of orthodoxy, just as the Bishop of Rome, known as the Pope, was the leader of uh, the Roman Catholic world. That occurred in 1054. And that schism has never been closed again. It has remained ever since. And the hostility is, and, uh, is bitter, indeed, between the two. And the line runs uh, right uh, through East Europe. Poland is on one side, it's Catholic. Poland, Lithuania is Catholic, along with uh, the Baltic states, which are Protestant, but used to be Catholic. So they belong to that side. That's why they, everyone says they are actually European historically. This is the meaning of it. But Ukraine was on the other side, but with a problem. Again, the same Western provinces, Galicia and uh, Vladimir. And I'll just come to that in a moment. It was in the 13th century, uh, shortly after the schism, that uh, the whole of the land of Rus, this is called the land of Rus, those who converted to orthodoxy. Uh, from Rus comes the word Russia. Uh, and uh, historically, we refer it to the land of Rus. The whole of Rus was invaded from two sides, by the Mongols in the east in 1237, by Genghis Khan's grandson, Batu Khan, and from the west, by the Roman Catholic Church's Crusades, by German Knights, the Teutonic Knights. The two prongs struck, uh, entered uh, the Slavic country, and everyone had to choose which side do you go to. Well, in the Russian national legend, the great choice was made by Alexander Nevsky of uh, Novgorod, a 19-year-old boy, he beat the Germans and the Swedes in a famous battle in 1240. And again in 1242, the Battle of the Ice, which you must have all seen, Alexander Nevsky, the film by Eisenstein. Uh, now, Alexander Nevsky was a brilliant general and a superb politician, and he decided it is safer to be, go with the Mongols than with the Roman Catholic Church. So he submitted to the Mongols, sub uh, subordinated himself to them, and gained security from them. They kept off the Roman Catholic Church and the Teutonic Knights. That is, the Mongols held off Europe, in short. And Alexander Nevsky made this choice. Uh, at the same time, another choice was made in Galicia and Volhynia. Prince Daniel of Galicia, in that place called Lvov, which he founded, or Lviv, he tried to orient, he, to escape the Mongols, turned to the Roman Catholic Church and to the empire and uh, 
conducted his marital diplomacy with uh, Poland and uh, Austria and so on. He didn't quite succeed. He still had to submit to the Mongols who were far more powerful. But that tradition remained. He preferred this orientation to the other and his successors all have preferred that. By one uh, historical choice or another, they have turned westward. To Poland, to the Habsburg Empire, to Czechoslovakia, as the case may be, to Hungary and so on. And that division has persisted. It's amazing that from the 13th century down to the 21st century, we have that same line of division. Galicia, Volhynia on one side, uh, rest of Ukraine partially on one side, the eastern part fully on the other side. So, uh, in this uh, uh, change that occurred, uh, there are certain other regions called Transcarpathia. Um, if you look down, do you see that place called Ushgorod? There. That is, e see the Carpathia, Carpathians, Eastern Car That area is the Transcarpathia. And down there is uh, the Chernovitsi is the what's called the Bukovina. These two territories also went into various Western kingdoms and empires at different times. Transcarpathia went into Hungary very early, and it has practically always been with there. But they are Ukrainian, or another version of the Ukrainians. They call themselves Rusins and so on. And this area is even called Ruthenia. All these other Central European names are applied to Ukraine. Ukraine. So all these areas were very Western oriented but the others uh, were oriented to the East, to the Orthodox Church. And uh, when uh, Moscow came up, to Moscow. The successors of Alexander Nevsky shifted to base themselves in Moscow, and Moscow took precedence over Kiev as a center of power in the whole of the Slavic world, or in the, in the world of Rus. To create one more division, in 1596, the, the Orthodox clergy of Western Ukraine uh, split, submitted to the Pope, but kept the Orthodox liturgy. It is a compromise in the conditions of the Counter-Reformation that was sweeping across Europe at that time. So they uh, uh, combined the Catholic and the Orthodox churches in this way. Under the Pope, but Orthodox in their liturgy and ritual. To the West, it seemed a good compromise. To them also seemed a good compromise because the ca Roman Catholic Church is getting very powerful and sweeping across. Oh, I'm running short. Uh, and, uh, but to the East, they looked upon as traitors, having left the uh, faith. So multiple divisions have occurred already. You've got the split between the in the uh, two churches. You've got the split within the Orthodox Church. And this new church is called the Uniat Church. They're also called Greek Catholics sometimes. But the name of the church is the Uniat. It's no longer called the Orthodox. So you've got the Uniats here, uh, Western oriented, and very much under the influence of Poland. At the same time, you've got the Eastern Orthodox one. It is in this situation <coughs> that Poland develops into a major empire from the uh, 14th to the 17th centuries. You have a Polish-Lithuanian empire stretching from the Baltic to the Black Sea virtually, or to the littoral of the Black Sea. And Poland is able to attract and dominate half of Ukraine. So it becomes a tussle between Poland and Russia. Now, Poland represents the West and this, the East. In, uh, it is in the course of all this that the first Ukrainian, properly Ukrainian state emerges, what is known as the Hetmanate, under the Cossacks. The Cossacks are the freebooting soldiery living on the borders uh, between the Ottoman Empire and uh, Poland, Lithuania, and Muscovy. Um, the Ottoman Empire, I must remind you, was... Uh, all along here, the northern uh, littoral of the Black Sea along the steppe regions. The Crimea and so on were all Ottoman Empire. Uh, 
So the Cossacks were uh, uh, self-governing uh, communities, uh, very warlike, who provided the frontier security to Poland, Lithuania, and to Moscow, to Muscovy, against the Ottomans. They were fiercely orthodox, however, and therefore they uh, conflicted with the uh, Polish Commonwealth. And they were forced eastward as Poland advanced and colonized more and more into Ukraine. So they came under Muscovy, uh, or Moscow. And in 1654, unable to con contest three sides like this, they finally decided to submit to Moscow. And hence, the he and that uh, state which they created is called the Hetmanate, the Hetman of the Cossack state. That is the one time that Ukraine actually had a somewhat independent state. It was still subordinate to Moscow, but it was a coherent state uh, uh, with Kiev at the center, and it was on both sides of the river Dnieper. And that is the time when Kiev flourished in the, uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, roughly one century of uh, great um, creativity in Kiev. It was a major academic and theological center. It provided all the resources, intellectual resources for Russia, more than Russia itself could generate. And it uh, drew into itself the dynamism of the Counter-Reformation uh, streaming from Europe through Poland and the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits. So they were able to combine it and uh, Kiev uh, developed into a very a flourishing center and provided one of the most important ideologues and um, <coughs> propagandists for Peter the Great in the early 18th century. So uh, this phase is when Ukraine had a, something like a state. And it is the basis of the proto-nationalism of the Ukrainians that this Hetmanate was a Ukrainian national state. They claim in Ukrainian historiography that it was equal of Moscow. Moscow, of course, says it was subordinate, that they had submitted in 1654 and paid homage to the Tsar. <coughs> uh, but in the 18th century, Moscow steadily absorbed the Hetmanate and finally redu reduced it to a series of provinces. The, uh, the state itself vanished. It became part of the Russian state. It became a series of provinces. The Hetmanate itself was abolished in the uh, late 18th century. and. Poland itself vanished. As you know, Poland was divided between uh, Russia, Prussia, and the Habsburg Empire in the course of the 18th century. So uh, Poland vanished. The Prussian, Habsburg, and Russian uh, kingdoms uh, moved towards each other, and uh, Ukraine was once again divided. In that division, Volhynia Galicia went into Poland, Transcarpathia into uh, sorry, uh, um, Volhynia went to Poland, Galicia into the Habsburg Empire. And this was a basis of a new nationalism in the West. When Galicia, the western part of Ukraine, went into the Habsburg Empire, the Habsburgs cultivated a Ukrainian culture <coughs> domestically in Galicia to counter Polish influences. Poland was a troublesome neighbor and subject of the Habsburgs. So Galicia flourished. In Galicia, a Ukrainian national culture flourished, properly speaking. And it was the beginning of nationalism in Europe. So your, uh, Ukrainian nationalism began to flourish there. That's how Galicia became such an important place for Ukrainian nationalism. And throughout the 19th century, up to 1918, Galicia was the center of Ukrainian nationalism. Sponsored and supported in every way by the Habsburgs, because not that they were nationalist at all or uh, liberal, but they wanted to outdo the or put down the Poles. Therefore, this was useful. Poland to them was more dangerous than anybody else. And uh, Russia finally faced this Galician Ukrainian nationalism when the time came. But it was all from here. It, this is the source of it. <coughs> now, uh, <coughs> in the uh, 19, uh, 20th century, when the uh, revolution occurred, when the empires all collapsed, the Russian, German, Austro-Hungarian, Ottoman, it was a time for everybody to create their own states. Uh, Finland, the three Baltic states, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, Romania, all of them managed. In the Caucasus, Georgia, of course that, that is part of the uh, Soviet one, I should not mention it, but it was very nationalist. It could be almost considered independent. All of them did. 
The one which did not succeed was Ukraine. It was a large territory. We see how it is. Uh, it has a significant history of nationalism in Galicia, at least, and partially in Volhynia. It is the source of Russian nationalism because of Kiev is where it all started, and yet it was not able to create its own state. Whereas all the much less well endowed, you might say, uh, regions like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, all of them managed to create their own. And Poland was resurrected all after having vanished from the map for a century and a half. And the reason is that is this particular fragmentation. They were never able to decide which way they have to be oriented. And they kept on raising the question amongst themselves, what is our fair destiny? Is it in the West or in the East? instead of being able to claim that it is with themselves. And because of the uh, pulls in each side, on, uh, to, in each direction, uh, it is more an internal division rather than the Russians and the Poles pulling them. It is an internal division. They could never settle. Uh, and when the Galicians were extravagantly Western-oriented, naturally the Eastern uh, Ukrainians, who were much more Russian-oriented, said, no, we cannot accept this, and we will... Uh, uh, rather look for support elsewhere, namely in Russia. And this went on. And in the uh, post-war uh, settlement, uh, Galicia once again went to Poland, Volhynia also there, Transcarpathia to Czechoslovakia, and Bukovina to Romania. The uh, uh, Poles went in for a rapid Polonization as much as possible, and in the 1930s, it became fascistic in that they repressed the language, the church, they tried conversions, and they went for uh, colonization, Polish colonization in Volhynia. So it created an enormous anti-Polish nationalism in Galicia and Volhynia. It did not make those people more Russian, pro-Russian, but they, may, they were violently uh, Ukrainian nationalists as a result of this. And in um, uh, Bukovina and so on, you had similar Ro Romanianization also taking place. So excellent ground for uh, the resurrection of Ukrainian nationalism now in the 20th century when nationalisms had gone so violent uh, before the Second World War. And this is a crucible of every possible nationalism you could think of. But it didn't help them come together at all because in the East was a completely different set of people. The Russians had colonized East Ukraine with the industrialization of the 19th century when the great uh, mines and uh, 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 metal plants were opened up. And, uh, and it was a, not only a Russian population, but also a Russian-speaking population. The Ukrainians had become Russian-speaking, and urbanization had led to a completely different combination. So you have... Uh, this kind of uh, uh, segregation here, yeah. an uh, urbanized, um, industrialized Eastern Ukraine, <coughs> an extremely uh, uh, nationalistic Western Ukraine, and uh, when the finally the Soviet Ukraine was created in the nineteen in the nineteen twenties, uh, the nationalistic U Western Ukraine was in Poland, outside of Ukraine. The rest of it was in the Soviet Union. So after the Hetmanate, this is the first time you had a Ukrainian state being created in the 1920s. So it should have generated an internal unification, we might have assumed, under normal circumstances. But what happened was this. The Russians went ahead with Ukrainianization. Namely, they promoted the language, promoted Ukrainians to jobs, created a uni uh, Ukrainian political structure, Ukrainian uh, Communist Party, everything Ukrainian, universities, etc. All the requirements were there, all the cultural and political institutions, which are completely Ukrainian. And Ukrainians were fully in charge of Ukraine for a change, except that the bosses were there, were in Moscow. But the state and the nation was created by external circumstances. It was created by the policies of Moscow of Leninist policies, rather than what is happening in Ukraine itself. I, I, I invite you to think for a moment about our own political history. The long period of uh, anti-colonial uh, mobilizations that took place, 
where every issue was thrashed out and leaders appeared in every uh, ideological position. And uh, there's no doubt about it as to uh, how it was to come together and who the great, and, all, and a series of charismatic leaders came up. That was not the case here. There was no state in waiting. It was Moscow which created the state here as part of the Soviet uh, nationalities creation. So Ukraine got a state, but from imp and by an impulse from outside. And otherwise, they were divided as ever. And that division showed up when the next opportunity came, which was in 1991. Then the whole of Ukraine became independent. Uh, Volhynia, Galicia, Transcarpathia, uh, Bukovina, the central Ukraine and eastern Ukraine all came together uh, as an independent state. They're already within the Soviet Union by after 1945, but now as an independent state. But their independence came once again. It dropped into the lap. It came from outside impulses. It was not a Ukrainian national movement which created Ukraine. It was a split within the Russian Communist Party or the Soviet Communist Party, uh, which demanded the breakup of the Soviet Union as part of the politics of the attack upon the party, and therefore the create the uh, independence of all the Union Republics. Hence, Ukraine became independent. There was no national movement till then. Of course, there were national st stirrings here and there of various kinds. But uh, again, look at our own history and you'll understand what I'm talking about. There was nothing of that kind. Uh, not even for 10 years was there a mere. The, in those five years that Gorbachev gave them, they set about it. And that was it. So Ukraine uh, got the state, the national, uh, the nation. It was somewhat hollow, uh, and it came by impulses from outside, and internally they were so terribly divided. So after the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, what happened? How did they try to uh, create an independent uh, uh, state and nation? It is still possible, but it never happened. They divided so deeply they could never do so. And if you study the nature of the advances of NATO and of the European Union towards Ukraine from the 1990s, each time you will see how uh, the arguments always were, should we join NATO, should we join the European Union, or should we hold them off because they are a threat to our culture, our way of life, our future politics, our fate is with Russia, and so on. It went this way constantly. And the... Uh, NATO, con see, uh, throughout the 90s and into the 21st century, uh, offered a lot of cooperation without membership. They would keep on setting up any number of uh, projects for cooperation, but never actually a membership. So Ukraine tried its best to uh, sort of uh, um, satisfy NATO by participating in various NATO exercises in Yugoslavia or even in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, Iraq wasn't NATO, or partially. Uh, the, uh, but ne it never got any benefit out of it. So it went on like this. And in 2008, NATO actually made the announcement that Georgia and Ukraine shall be offered membership, which led instantly to the Georgian crisis. The president of Georgia, uh, Saakashvili, uh, rashly assumed that now he had NATO support for invading Ossetia, that is uh, now under Russia. And uh, the Russians drove him back. That was a brief war in 2008, if you remember. Uh, and after that, the European Union and NATO uh, held back because they were not confident that uh, they could deal with what Russia was going to do or deal with Russian reactions in this case. But it always was a case of testing Russian reactions how far they could go, and when they found the reaction was too strong, they would withdraw. And the ones who were pr uh, suggesting perpetually that they can go into, uh, that NATO can go forward, was America and Poland. These are the two proponents constantly. Poland is, as you know, virulently anti-Russian uh, over a long history. Uh, and the ones who are holding back were Germany and France, the two pillars of the European Union. They said, this is not for us. We cannot uh, afford these adventures. And while uh, uh, European policy was, in this sense, uncertain, 
uh, Ukraine in, in it itself was internally so divided, it could never settle which way it would do it. And these were revealed again and again in this series of crises we know as the um, Orange Revolution and the Euromaidan crisis. The Orange Revolution in 2004-05 uh, and the Euromaidan in 2013-14. Uh, briefly what they amounted to, or they, what the important part of it, in, in uh, the crisis of uh, uh, the Orange Revolution, they were trying to decide uh, who was to be the president. Was it to be uh, 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 uh or Yanukovych. Uh, both of them carry the name Victor, by the way. Uh, Yushchenko was completely pro-Western. Yanukovych was completely pro-Russian. This is how they presented themselves. Both were highly discredited politicians uh, in every way. The levels of corruption and sleaze is extraordinary. We we are accustomed to a lot. But I can tell you, our institutions are monuments of integrity and stability compared to what uh, Ukraine had uh, in every way. So, and the worst is, when the crisis of corruption occurs in uh, Ukraine, repeatedly, it leads to a collapse of government. Uh, this is the problem in Ukraine. Uh, we have corruption endlessly, scandals endlessly, but it doesn't actually destabilize the state. In Ukraine, what is happening, each time there was a, a corruption scandal, the state itself was uh, destabilized and disintegrating in some way or the other. And in uh, the, the crisis of the uh, Orange Revolution was one, one such. Uh, they could not decide who was to be. Of course, the election commission there was a, one of the most corrupt bodies you could think of. So was the Supreme Court. So was the bureaucracy. So were the police. Everybody you can imagine was had their finger in the pie or their... <coughs> Uh, snout in the trough. So uh, finally, how was it settled? Who decided uh, the result? It was an international mediation. Foreign ministers of uh, Poland, Germany, France and uh, uh, leaders from Russia came and settled the issue. Now if you have an internal dispute between political parties, between a government and opposition and you need foreigners to settle it, you can imagine how weak the state is. It's an index of it. Uh, and this happened again in the Euromaidan crisis in 2014-15. Exactly the same story. Uh, it led to bloodshed uh, when, uh, when the then president uh, Yanukovych refused to sign the uh, uh, signed, uh, um, an agreement with Europe, with the European Union, and the uh, Western Ukrainians were, went wild and said, how, "How dare you stop it? We have to have it." And they brought their masses into uh, Kiev to the Maidan, it's called the Maidan by the way, the big square there, some uh, sort of Ramlila Maidan there, and uh, they conducted their agitations there and the police went berserk and shot uh, 80 persons down and so on. But in the course of that you had people like John McCain coming and addressing the crowds there. And finally it was uh, settled by an intervention by European politicians coming and mediating and deciding who the new president should be. Now. Uh, I don't know what we would think if we had American senators coming and speaking in our election rallies uh, in Delhi, of all places. And then you had uh, mediators coming from China, Russia, Europe and America to decide who the prime minister should be. But this is exactly what happened in Ukraine. It's an index of the weakness of the Ukrainian state and the uh, chaos of Ukrainian politics and the corruption of civic uh, bureaucratic and uh, political life there in every way. And uh, Ukraine became such a victim there in, uh, in all these respects. So this is the context in which, this is what enables NATO to make the advance into Ukraine. There's nobody in Ukraine, there's no consensus of policy in Ukraine about what they should do. They just pulled in two directions permanently. So NATO can make all these advances, Russia can make a counter advance, and finally Ukraine is up for auction. Sometimes literally. Who will offer more grants? Is it Putin or the European Union? It has happened in, in the case of Yanukovych. Uh, it goes that way. And the matter is never settled. And that is what it has uh, led to even now. Now, with, with these, uh, in these circumstances, uh, when it cannot be settled, the tussle is then between, that is why it is between Russia and America finally. Ukraine is not a real player. Ukraine is only the foot soldiers. 
in this uh, battle or in this conflict. Uh, they are the uh, sacrificial lambs, you might say, to both sides. Uh, they, uh, they cannot decide. It will have to be decided between America and Russia. And they are the two who are not negotiating. The ones who are negotiating are Ukrainians and Russians. And Ukrainians are being told what to negotiate uh, and not to surrender any position. And Zelensky is constantly uh, playing the role of Churchill or trying to. But that's not the real position he is in. He is completely helpless. But we do not see a solution. So if you ask me well, what, is the, what is pushing it so far, why, is the, wh why should NATO be, ad uh, be advancing and why is America pushing so far? The ultimate reason is this, I would suggest that the agenda of the Cold War is incomplete. Russia is still not down. Uh, Soviet Union is down, uh, it has broken up, but Russia still remains as a potential future power. It, I don't think it is likely to develop into that, but it has to be brought down. And I think American strategy is, in the long run, to see Russia in the position of Germany and Japan after the Second World War. It has to reach that position for American security, finally, uh, to dominate the world. After that, it'll turn on China. But uh, till then, it's Russia that takes uh, precedence over anybody else. And that position has not yet been reached. And uh, these advances are all ways of testing Russia. And uh, you, you do remember Brzezinski's uh, suggestion that Russia should split into three different states. European Russia, West Siberia, and East Siberia. And he said, Russia is just too backward to exploit Siberia, therefore we will, we meaning America. It's, it's just like Canada, you see. So uh, if you can develop Canada, why can't you develop Siberia? But obviously the Russians have not been able to develop it. And so on. So, I mean, th these might be fanciful, but uh, certainly these ideas circulate a lot. And they see the possibilities. So if, they, uh, if they can bring down the Soviet Union, why not bring down Russia? It is eminently possible, as they see it. And this is part of that game. And Ukraine is just in the way, is just, as it were, uh, on the way to Moscow. The next would be Belarus, it could be Georgia, it could be Armenia, each one of these, one by one. But what we are witnessing is just such a movement. And I would suggest that's the reason it is happening. Uh, I do not want to pass judgments on either side about how, uh, how much the Ukrainians are suffering or the Russians are nasty people or whatever, or Putin is... Uh, crazy that I, I don't think those are very useful suggestions uh, it is the uh, contest between great powers in this fashion which we are witnessing and wars always are horrible but it's interesting that which we are witnessing and wars always are horrible but it's interesting that the entire media in the West has presented this as a humanitarian problem only as if there's nothing else to it all wars are humanitarian problems but this has taken precedence over anything else almost to an extent that we seldom realize when we talk about wars. There's, no, there's little discussion about strategy, only about the humanitarian crisis. It is to build up the complete unity of the Western world against Russia. And that it has succeeded very well. Such uh, unanimity of opinion, such solidarity has seldom been seen at, at this level. And Russia is taking the hit. Russia will be a victim, obviously. It will not come out of it well. Uh, it will be um, uh, terribly impoverished uh, as a consequence of this. And we see some traces of back to Soviet times for Russia. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I took so long. Fantastic. Absolutely, I think, uh, you know, amazing scope of uh, the lecture that Professor Palat has delivered this evening. And I was just making notes saying that the last few minutes, I mean, there's a macro geography, macro politics, macro strategic culture where he spoke about what could be the objectives and the end game, a Russia that may be divided perhaps. But an interesting aside about connectivity and technology, Madhavan, when you were talking about corruption in Ukraine and comparing it with what is happening in this part of the world. My technical team has sent a message saying that there is a spike in the interest from outside and that we may get some responses on social media. But that's okay. I think it's part of democracy and the kind of reach we have. But uh, from the time that Professor Palat started his lecture, and I think the hall has, in a way, become fuller, I want to recognize those who have joined us both physically and 
on cyber through these links. The cyber first. I'm told that <laughs> it's an interesting message. The wise men of GK2 have joined and they wanted to be acknowledged. So I'm acknowledging you, you know, through this medium. I'm sure it'll reach out to you. And those who have joined on cyber and through the links, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and our team will make sure that they come up here. That's the first announcement. GK2, you're recognized. I want to also recognize General Suresh who's joined us, Dr. Yadav who's come here. And I'm told that I can only refer to him as Citizen Gopal Gandhi, so I shall sort of stay that way and say that we are delighted that all of you are here. And now what I will do is that there's so much ready that Professor Palath has shared with us. I will request you to please uh, ask your questions or make your observations again briefly. As is the normal protocol, please kindly uh, identify yourself and you can ask your question and if possible, I'll take two or three at a time and then I'll come to the uh, participants who are on cyber. So I shall take you all one by one from each side. Uh, I think I saw General Suresh there, Ashwini, then I'll come and I'll come this way, is that okay? Mics, please, first mic. And we'll request Professor Palat to respond there. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Suresh Bhattacharya. Uh, absolutely, uh, with uh, great clarity and simplicity, you've presented a very complex situation. Sir, my question is very fundamental. We expected that uh, with the Russian advance, and we know about their blitzkrieg techniques, that Zelensky will roll up in a few days and go away. Now, with your presentation, it becomes clear that it's a fragmented society, uh, which indicates uh, more so that should have happened in a fragmented society. It hasn't happened. So where is the confidence uh, which, uh, with which uh, President Zelensky and his team is conducting these operations? Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I'm uh, Colonel Ashwini Chanan from GK2, sir. <laughs> And uh, my question, sir, is you mentioned financial sanctions briefly, uh, but we, we probably couldn't cover it more. But yesterday I saw Karan Thapa's interview of the former RBI governor, Raghuram Rajan, uh, and, he, and he's written an essay on the uh, weaponization of the economic san uh, sanctions. And he spoke about that the way they're being rolled out now, it creates a precedence. And we are, uh, since we have military men, we are aware of a word called collateral damage. But in terms of economic sanctions and the weaponization, the collateral damage is far wider and addresses probably those segments of the society. The middle class and the rich will be able to bear it, but the poor. And that is going to have a significant effect, number one. Number two, it creates a precedence for use of these sanctions beyond the Ukraine context. It will go probably across, and uh, Professor uh, Rajan said, uh, for abortions, for human rights, Probably the Western world would take it beyond this to other parts of the geography as well. So what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I know you uh, probably based your lecture on the historical part of it, but this is now looking ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, General. Uh, yes, uh <coughs> your uh, guess that uh, uh, Zelensky should uh, have submitted earlier, given that he is in such a fragmented society. But the point is that precisely because it's so fragmented, he's getting a lot of support from uh, a certain type of rabid nationalism on the West, plus Poland, which plays a very important role, by the way, surprisingly. It is the one that is always uh, egging him on. And he is being uh, sustained by the Euro uh, European Union in, in, and in America. That here We are here to back you up in one way or the other. So don't uh, commit yourself. So that gives him the courage to do so. And he's getting the supplies of uh, weaponry. I do not know how effective they are and so on. I mean, we are subject to a lot of disinformation, I know. Uh, might be or might not be. But certainly a certain amount is coming from there. And that has enabled him to hold out in this way. So he sees the possibility of playing a, a heroic role here, almost a Churchillian role, uh, with this kind of backing, and he is almost blackmailing the West, saying, it is now time for you to intervene, and why aren't you doing so? And the humanitarian crisis which he is constantly projecting, and which is being lapped up in the Western press, 
uh, is designed to uh, force the Western leaders to respond to that. Uh, it's coming, a lot of it is coming out of him. So if a hospital is bombed and one person dies, they say uh, something close to war crime, genocide, etc. Uh, the hospital is empty, but nonetheless, uh, it's made out that it is some colossal hu uh, humanitarian crisis has occurred. Of course, always there is the three and a half million to four million uh, refugees now, but that is how he is presented. So he has been strengthened in this way, and he really has nowhere else to go. He's taken such an extreme position. If he now makes a co any sort of a uh, commitment to the Russian side, he uh, loses out totally, and uh, he'll be so disgraced. Uh, he, uh, perhaps he has no future. You may remember, he, he might even be wanting to die heroically. Remember, he said, this might be the last time you'll see me. That was his first uh, broadcast. Uh, it, it would be a wonderful death. Uh, he would be a hero uh, and an ideal end to a impasse. He, he cannot get out of it. That might be why. Uh, yeah, so now for uh, your... Uh, uh, weaponizing yeah, weaponizing economic sanctions. You're very right. That's uh, very likely to happen. Uh, weapons at one time, I mean, uh, sanctions at one time we assumed uh, for... Uh, these kinds of uh, for, uh, part of warfare, but if it goes to this extent and the uh, uh, masses are to be uh, affected, it's the same as uh, civilian uh, bombing of civilian areas. I mean, indiscriminate bombing we denounce as war crimes, but these we do not. But the same civilians are hit, the most helpless ones who cannot do anything at all. Uh, and that is not part of war crime, but nonetheless, it will now, I think, will be used. And in different ways, it is being used. Human rights is always being sanctioned. Uh, by America in one way or the other. The, the, and they can choose these. So the precedent has been set, and uh, I'm sure that this will be necessarily such a big stimulant to do that, because when they want it, they can use it. They have done it before. But it, uh, it doesn't necessarily encourage it further, I think. Well, even without the mic. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to uh, know from you what you think might be the war aim of uh, Putin and Russia. Uh, would it be a kind of Bangla semi-Bangladesh kind of model, Bangladesh war kind of model in which you decide to liberate certain areas which are seen as being independent and then declare victory and stop? Or is there uh, uh, a Sino-Indian kind of uh, war kind of model in which you enter and then you go back and uh, sort of teach a lesson or think you have taught a lesson or is it something else? Uh, this is, uh, it, it doesn't seem clear because from the Western media one gathers uh, the way it's put across that uh, well, uh, Russia simply wants to take over the whole of Ukraine. On the other hand, uh, there was a statement of the Turkish foreign minister uh, in the context of the talks between Ukraine and uh, Russia that uh, they were close to agreement. So uh, perhaps you could elaborate on just behind you. Good evening, sir. Uh, my question was, um, if we can uh, measure the impact of dignifying uh, regional histories uh, to portray it as a set of uh, cherry-picked events, maybe, or the impact it might have on identity and uh, the perception of a national character uh, in this current situation that we face. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Anil. Uh, about the war aims, uh, it's a bit of a mystery. Uh, it's, uh, it has not been declared uh, clearly. Uh, or rather, he has said no, uh, no NATO. And he has even said, well, uh, practically said this uh, Zelensky must go. But there's no idea of taking over the whole of Ukraine. That would be a disaster for him because that will turn the whole of Ukraine against him. As it is an invasion of Ukraine, however well disposed Eastern Ukraine might be towards Russia, he's losing that support because it is an invasion. Warfare doesn't bring uh, 
uh, support that way necessarily, unless it is quick and finished like in Bangladesh. Certainly not when it takes so long and there is uh, so many civilian casualties. And the war is not popular in Russia either. Putin is not so, uh, certain of the domestic support he has, which is one reason he is accusing the Americans of trying to create a domestic constituency. Uh, Russians are certainly exasperated with Ukrainians and Ukrainian nationalism and politics, but they do not want to see a war there because there's such intimate connections between Russia and Ukraine. This is very important to bear in mind. Uh, it is like England and Scotland. Uh, they do not w wish to see uh, uh, invasion and, uh, and destru destruction on the scale. So uh, the war, uh, his war aim would be to make it impossible for Ukraine or for NATO or anybody to think in terms of a NATO implant there. That would be the main purpose. And if that is achieved, then that is enough. So it will be perhaps more like the Chinese model. It will come in and go out. Uh, and saying, I've taught you a lesson, now do not repeat it. Uh, the, but the point is, he will do great damage to Ukraine in the course of it. Ukraine d d will suffer very badly. Uh, it's a price he's prepared to pay. He says, whatever happens, you will have to suffer this damage if you try this. You people get your act together. Don't think that being pro-Western means being anti-Russian in this fashion. And all the extravagances of uh, Gillesian, Valinian um, nationalism should not be carried over to the whole of Ukrainian policy in this fashion. So I think that would be the objective. Uh, he'd be very unwise to try to take over the whole of Ukraine. He doesn't want to, I think, either. As for the question about regional histories and does it legitimize or, or uh, am I picking on particular histories to then make a point? No, I think uh, the question really is that regional histories and their interpretation, meaning hmm. that narrative, yeah. does it become an important determinant in stoking this kind of nationalism. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I got from your question. Well, Regional history, their interpretation, so the yeah. power of narrative mm. and how that in turn perhaps is impacting. Well, that was a burden of my talk, in a sense. It was the regional uh, diversion, uh, divergences that are leading to this condition of Ukraine. It is not what is leading to actually Putin's decision to enter, but the condition of Ukraine which allows uh, these external forces to play such a powerful role within Ukraine is due to this kind of regional differences. It is not just NATO and um, uh, Putin uh, at war just now, but earlier, as, we, as I explained about the Euromaidan crisis and the Orange Revolution crisis, uh, it is a series of foreigners who are deciding who the Prime Minister and President should be, uh, uh, repeatedly. Now, that is an extraordinary situation of its own. And at every point, it is the European Union which is instructing the Election Commission, the Supreme Court, the bureaucracy, and so on, how they should function, and what standards they should attain, and giving them marks uh, as if they are in school about how uh, to qualify for entry into the European Union, and so on. That, that is due to an internal regional, regionalization of Ukraine, uh, which they haven't been able to resolve yet. That is certainly the case. I'll have to read this from here, because this is the one that's why. We have a question from one of our cyber participants. Mr. Suraj Kumar, if you can hear me. The question is for Professor Madhavan. Is there a humanitarian crisis in the Ukraine? Professor Madhavan, please take a clear stance. It's a very interesting kind of <laughs> firm request to the learned professor. I'll recognize maybe one or two people. I'll definitely will to keep the 8 p.m. And uh, Ravi, you're coming in last, but I'll try and get both you gentlemen in. Okay, I'll get some of you also. Yes, there is a humanitarian crisis, certainly, uh, quite obviously. Uh, if you have uh, th uh, three and a half to four million refugees already uh, who have to flee from uh, uh, Ukraine into Europe or at least to Lvov and so on, they're displaced. But outside the Ukraine, there are already 30, uh, three and a half to four million. Within the Ukraine, there are many more who are displaced. It, it is an obvious crisis. I mean, nobody need underestimate that. My point was not to say that there is no crisis. My point is that every war is a humanitarian crisis. I do not want to pretend that there's some nice sweet wars where you have it all good. That is only happens in children's books. Uh, but all wars are of this kind, and modern wars particularly are necessarily so. Civilians are almost competent uh, in a way that they were not until the middle of the 19th century. Uh, they, they are the first targets 
Uh, in fact, it is safer to be a soldier than a civilian, I think, in many wars in modern times. At least as a soldier, you're armed and you know how to fight. As a civilian, you have no such capacities. And you are sitting duck all the time. <coughs> so, uh, yes, it is a very major crisis, and without a doubt. Uh, and uh, nobody is underestimating that, I'm sure. And I hope I've taken a clear enough stand on that, despite skepticism. I think I'm very clear, but just for Mr. Suraj Kumar, and you know, I may say this from here if I may. Oh. I think it's a very important point that Madhavan has made. Uh, Mr. Kumar, you, you know, introduced a very important dimension about the humanitarian crisis. I just, you know, make one statement because this is a very important subject, needs a whole session and more. That technology, if you look at it from both the world wars, has actually rendered the citizen vulnerable. You know, for instance, the aerial bombing and so on. But as I said, this is a very important subject. This is not the first humanitarian crisis. It has just received much greater attention. But let me leave it at there. This is not a value judgment. This is just a very, I would say, sad admission of uh, technology and politics and the vulnerability of a citizen. But uh, on that note, what I will do is I'll recognize you two gentlemen. And at the back, and if you all could just make your, oh, ma'am, Joe. Um, OK, please, sir. Yeah, Liana, can you just speak? Yeah. Mike is coming to you. I'll get you on board, Joe. Uh, sir, I'm Captain D.K. Singh from Indian Navy. Uh, sir, during your talk, you said that uh, post uh, this conflict, Russia will take a major hit. Uh, just uh, one point, sir. Uh, the dependency of European Union for gas to Russia, and as the winter approaches, it will further go up. China might go to Russia. The Russian foreign minister is visiting India for the gas. So maybe after five, six months, after the war gets over, Russia may be able to bounce back because of the world energy need. What is your point, sir, on this? If Russia is going to bounce back, will there be a new circuit of Russia, Iran, China, and India? Thank you for that very wide-ranging lecture. So uh, while you were speaking, I was uh, thinking. I sure, I'm Tarun Saint. So uh, just to uh, yes, go back to some of the points you were making, I was somehow reminded of the context of the Cold War and the accentuated sense of mirror images that then prevailed, and that sense of the mirroring of the darkest side of the other, uh, which, of course, is so well captured in some of the spy novels of John Le Carre and others. But here, there's that heating up, of course, of the Cold War into an actual war, a flashpoint, which has uh, led to the invasion. And uh, the, the, the science fiction writer Vladimir Sorokin has written about Putin in particular, in a particular light in this context as sort of somehow regressing back to a kind of imperial, autocratic, almost czarist era model. And he also seems to think that uh, Putin has a particular kind of uh, agenda, which is to destroy Western civilization. Now, of course, one can't say whether that's actually verifiable, uh, but psychologically speaking, uh, is there a kind of uh, tendency towards that uh, sort of regression into the darker side of the heart, uh, which is not just exclusively Russian in its orientation, uh, but which war can kind of sort of uh, give free play to, as it were, a kind of narcissism which is projected outwards, externalized. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Jyoti Malhotra. and. Uh, as a card-carrying member of the Madhavan Palat fan club, I'd just like to say thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. My question is, if there is a humanitarian crisis, which of course there is, three and a half, four million people, uh, refugees, if, as you say, the Russian population is divided over the war with Ukraine, um, and if Putin's goals aren't, aren't as clear, then would you say that the Russian president has sort of walked into a trap, um, perhaps of his own making. I mean, he needn't have bombed Ukraine into submission to be able to denazify it or to, uh, to avert sort of NATO missiles or other armaments on, on Russia's door. Thank you. I'm going to request uh, the esteemed Professor Madhavan to give us Twitter replies. 
in very short characters <laughs> because but as i said to the extent that you can and we will then have him here a few minutes after the formal closure Con but madhavan all yours contradiction in terms you said prof <laughs> <coughs> you said professor professors never speak for less than one hour at a time you yeah just <coughs> <try>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, uh, will uh, uh, russia be able to bounce back uh, not in a hurry uh, it's going to be uh, quite a tough uh, call because, or, of course, it has energy supplies to be provided to Europe, and Europe will compromise on the matter, I think, because of that. And therefore, Russia has a negotiating space available. It will not be as die hard as it is now. But bouncing back will be a bigger job because the resources on the other side are so much greater to punish Russia than for Russia to be able to punish them. So Russia will be back into a trap of the kind of a closed space like it was in the Soviet Union. Uh, th th that world is partially coming back, perhaps, uh, rather than Russia being able to bounce back and being able to deal equally with everybody and uh, with the rest of the world, I think. Um, Tarun Sen's uh, qu uh, qu uh, question about the context of the Cold War and the mirror images. Uh, the Cold War was the best example of the mirror images. Yes, that's very true because the two sides are so well balanced. Uh, well, not really so balanced. Our Soviet Union is much weaker still, but uh, ostensibly very well balanced and they had resources enough to pit against each other's way. Um, we do not find that occurring now. Russia is very isolated, actually. I mean, all this China being friendly is a very limited operation. China will not choose Russia over US. Why should it? China is just striking a good bargain with both the US and uh, Russia in such a situation. Uh, anybody would choose US if you can get it. Uh, the whole point is to get it. And therefore, you, this is the right time to strike the bargain. Uh, so uh, Russia is terribly, terribly isolated. Uh, at least during the Cold War, it wasn't. It had a whole series of supporters around the world not the least all the communist parties outside the Soviet bloc. They were a major support base. All that's gone now. So Russia has a sort of residual sympathy and there are a whole lot of people around the world who say, well, this is not our war and therefore we are not uh, joining in. Uh, and by neutrality becomes a form of support for Russia. In the whole of Ukraine, that's how it's interpreted also. Are you pro-Western or are you neutral? Neutral means pro-Russian. So in that sense, Russia has a certain worldwide support. Uh, but otherwise, Russia is very isolated, and that support is not going to be translated into real action of any kind. Uh, Jyoti's point, uh, if Russia is internally divided, as Russia walked into a trap, uh, it's not a trap. For Russia, it's a choice between either the, uh, submitting to NATO now or trying to hold it off for, uh, and see how much you can negotiate and how, far, how long you can keep NATO off. So... Uh, and the Americans are constantly giving them that, that choice. We are coming, we are coming, we are coming. And what are you going to do? So finally Putin took, the, took his uh, stand and said, let us see how far you can go. So it's not a trap, but it is a um, denouement he was expecting for a long time. And in fact, Russians have been expecting since the 1990s with uh, the uh, positions of NATO. It, it is structured this way. Uh, they all know it's going to happen. It's like a Greek tragedy. We all know it's going to happen. Uh, what do you do about it? How far can you go? And how, uh, what negotiating space do you have? That is what he's trying to find out. So he's not been caught, but he's doing the best that he can. Thank you, Madhavan. Uh, uh, it's just, you know, I'm in a bit of a dilemma because I promised some people who asked me over coffee that we'll stop sharp at 8. What I can do is that, you know, if it's okay by our speaker and you, maybe we could spend some time informally when we close the session, sir, I hope you don't mind. I have two people from cyber and I'm going to apologize to them also, Mr. Dilip Simeon from New Delhi and Mr. Vinod Kumar from Kochi. I'm sorry, sirs, I can't take your questions because of the lack of time. We promised we'd close by eight and I know some of you have to uh, catch up with other appointments. The question here from Dilip Simeon, and not to be answered, uh, Professor Palat, did Ukraine, along with Belarus and the Russian Federation, have separate seats in the UN General Assembly? Yes. Yes is a short answer. I'm sorry, I don't want to make this into a quiz. Sorry, Dilip. And the second is, what bearing did the Russian suppression of Chechnya have on the geopolitics of the current situation? There are more questions. I'm not going to read them, and I am really apologize for this. 
uh, you know, over the last two years of COVID. Sirs, at the back, you there, sir, my apologies, but Madhavan will be here. You can speak to him separately, one on one. Uh, two years of COVID, you know, we were all been attending some webinars, conferences, and so on. And there was one very interesting innovation, you know, where I had participated in one of these pan India events. And when we had finished and the guest speak, the lead speaker, the host who was not in the same location said that we have a tradition of presenting a shawl to the esteemed chief guest or the speaker. Those of you who are familiar with South India would recognize this. Many shawls are presented to the lead speaker or the chief guest at the end of an event. That was not possible because of the COVID protocols. So they had introduced what they called as a shawl of appreciation that was conveyed by an oral manner. So today, I'm taking the liberty of inviting Mr. Ravi Bhutalingam, who's sitting here. I've just shanghaied him, Ravi, if I may say so, who's also been a speaker in our series. And interestingly, I just not, got to know about this when we were having a cup of coffee or tea, that Ravi and Madhavan were in school together, the St. Columbus Mafia, and then went onwards to Delhi University Stephens and then onwards to UK to London, Oxford, Cambridge, and then went separate paths. So Ravi, can I, you know, put this on you? You can speak from there if you want, if you don't want to disturb the others. Saab ko mic wahi de na. Is that okay? So that, you know, you are. The only thing is that if you speak from here, the cyber world will hear you. So you want to come here maybe. Whatever you say. If you can move on your right, it'll be easier, I think, as opposed to the ladies on this side. Sorry, folks, for being so. Bye bye. We understand. I know you had to leave at 8 o'clock. Just give us a few more minutes and we'll wrap up. Hey, Saab, yahi aenge, because I think it'll be easier. I should have thought of this and made Ravi sit at the end, but I hadn't planned that far. Please. This is the virtual shawl. Ravi? Is there something physical you're going to give me? <laughs> no. no. We okay. Haven't planned it. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, after that absolutely magnificent uh, presentation, I'm not going to stand in, in your way. I have no qualification at all in geopolitics or history or anything resembling the field that uh, Madhavan has covered. Uh, I think it's only my long association with him. And what I've discovered during that association uh, which is that he has, as you would have noticed, two absolutely essential qualities which are very, very rare and make occasions like this very worthwhile. One is a very deep knowledge of whatever he's, he's talking about. And I've seen this time and again because I've attended a large number of his talks. And the second is the power of language and communication. So he is able to communicate that knowledge to an audience, whether physical or now cyber. Each one of these qualities would have been very unusual if it had just been alone. But when you combine those, you get a very remarkable effect. And thank you very much for that, uh, Madhavan, for this evening. So having said this, let me drape the shawl. At least I'll do it symbolically. <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> OK, it just remains for me to thank all of you formally for being here. Just to add to what Ravi said, maybe one more quality for Madhavan is that he wears his learning lightly. And I think that's also very rare. And today's lecture has been absolutely, I think, impressive in terms of its scope and its lucidity. And hopefully, and I don't want to make this sound like a threat, but Professor Palath has promised to share his notes at an appropriate time. <laughs> that will be circulated. But thank you very much, everyone. I know you all need to go. I just want to thank you all and leave a last note as encouraging those of you who are here that we will be doing this again under the Habitat SPS banner and you know we hope that you will be able to join us. I do want to encourage our younger members this evening who are here that if you would like to write about this subject, his talk, 
why I don't agree with Madhavan Palat would be a great way of you know writing 800 900 words we'll hoist it in one of our websites but otherwise we'll keep you informed leave your cards if you want to be on our mailing list over here and we'll make sure you come I want to thank all of you personally especially for your cell phone discipline doesn't happen all the time but not a phone rang and our entire team apart from thanking our speaker formally thanking the habitat mr sony tandon the director who's here the sps tarun has just left and the entire team the cyber team that's worked quietly silently i know i can name shadab george sushil anandita shreya in different parts of india for allowing us and enabling us to conduct this in the seamless manner that we have thank you ladies and gentlemen good night and we'll catch up those of you who had questions please come up he'll also sign autographs this evening i think thank you